I'm so much in love with Riesling that almost all vintages are Riesling for me. <laughs> but uh, that's maybe not the, the whole truth. So, and 2019 was in fact one or maybe the only vintage that I often preferred uh, the Veltliners to the Rieslings, at least when they were young. And um, yeah, so let me introduce you maybe a bit to the, to the 2019 vintage as far as I know it, um, because I'm living 1,000 kilometers far away um, from, from the Wachau and from the, from the Danube. Um, but of course I have spoken with the producers and, um, and tasted a lot of wine. So if, if you remember 2018 was extremely dry and warm vintage and uh, since so many in the last since 2015 and uh, there was quite a, a row of very warm vintages and also dry vintages and I remember in in 2018 when the harvest was um, uh, it was still so warm uh, even at night there was no harvest at night but, but temperatures didn't go down again uh, in 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 2018 and um, and the wines turned out pretty well so I was surprised they were not they were of course full-bodied, but they also had a good, good purity and good freshness. Of course, there was no botrytis or not much. Um, and uh, 2019 was uh, was not that dry, and it didn't get these extremely high temperatures like in 2018. And in 18, there were also because I, I remember I was tasting in um, September and in June in 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 18 and. Uh, I saw the leaves, not of the vines. The vines were the only plant that looked healthy, but all the rest was suffering from drought. And um, in 19, I think there was a uh, there was more rain, and you didn't have the high temperature peaks uh, like in 18, and never these long periods, let's say two or three weeks. And um, and then in uh, in autumn, it was a downright brilliant vintage uh, period. Um, because it was not that warm again. So we had in September pretty cool nights. Uh, this was very helpful to, 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 keep, uh, to keep the fresh fruit aromas and, and acidity. And also the pH levels were lower than in, in 2018. So, and again, no botrytis. Uh, and there was really nothing that could have complicated the harvest in 2019. So. Uh, to me, I'm I'm not really sure if I don't. I think I prefer 19 to 18, although it's it's also great vintage. But um, however, I'm I'm a great fan of 19 and especially from the Feldliners. And I think 20 will be again very interesting, more cooler vintage, more complicated, of course, but um, very spicy wine that re that remind me on the time when I started writing or tasting wines a lot in the early. Or in the in the in the 90s, um, this was a style of wine that I know from from that time. Uh, the wines are very pure in 20 and and spicy and uh, fresh, and I, I like them a lot. And and I think the the producers rediscovered 20 after 19, which was for them brilliant as well. Um, but many told me that. Uh, I remember last year in June, some didn't really want to show me the 20s. They said, well, you didn't have taste the 90s, so you have to taste the 19s and then you come back for 21 or so. I said, no, 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 I want to, to, to I like the 20s. And uh, this, this was last year in June. I spent the whole month in, in the Danube Valley. And, uh, uh, and I really, it was very hot again, again, and uh, these wines were absolutely refreshing. So, but back to, to 19. Um, yeah, so Gobelsburg, it's um, now they have 851 years, <laughs> the domain, it's uh, impressive and they have, a, they have a new cellar, not a new one, but they build a new cellar like the monks would have done 1000 years ago and uh, absolutely well done, perfect. And this is just a room for storing wines, not for producing, it's just they, as you might have heard, they have these uh, this reserve wine concept they have introduced to a new 
uh, to a new wine line they call tradition or heritage where they blend uh, several vintages in one wine so they have a three five and a, and the, the the other one they blended 50 vintages like uh, like a grand cuvee from cook um, so pretty impressive wine so and um, you know the most famous wine from Gobelsburg is and the most expensive wine and they are not expensive at all but the most expensive wine is it's the um, uh, Ried Lamm Grünefeld Liner and uh, Michi Mosbrugger the the uh, the winemaker and uh, the chef of Gobelsburg he started in 96 I think he's he's always a great fan from from Ried Group um, which is another single vineyard or cru it's a uh, it's a very well protected bassin uh, between uh, Heiligenstein and Geisberg, so two Riesling top Riesling sites in uh, in the Kamtal, and uh, yeah, and uh, since that is so well protected, is 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 brilliant for Grünefeld Liner, which which likes the deeper soils, and um, and we have here a pure Lus and. Um, yeah, some, some. They, I think they found really bones from the Stone Age time there as well, and it has to be a settlement many, many ten thousand years ago or something like that. Um, yeah, so let's let's see what this wine is uh, is like, and then it's it's fermented and uh, aged in large large oak cask. It's 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 very rich. It's it's also extract sweet, but it has a nice salinity and and mouth tackling finish. It's becoming sweeter now with the with the, with the, those one year older now. Um, but but it has a good freshness and it is full bodied and it's it's long on the palate. But uh, I don't feel it alcoholic. It's a it's very fine and elegant wine, and. Um, the, uh, the Ried group is not that close to the Danube River like uh, many many vineyards are, for example, in the Bachau. And um, I think for for this the whole area, it's it's pretty important. Sometimes it's good to be far away from the from the river. Sometimes it's good to to be more close. Um, and I think from the wines from the Wagram, I think is that the, no, it's the third wine. Uh, that is far away from the from the Danube River, but goes high in altitude. Um, okay, so uh, this this wine is has been aged in in oak cask for about a year, a little bit less, um, and they release now the 2000 uh, uh, all the new vintages after two years. So they don't come the next year, but they they wait for two years, especially the, so the single vineyard sites, of course, not the not the uh, grape variety or the the village wines. Um, so wine number two is 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 also that is one of my my personal favorites because he does so many things different, like like so many in in uh, in uh, in the Danube or in the Wachau as well. Martin Mutenthaler, he used to be uh, the tractor driver for the Domain Wachau for many years. And uh, but his parents they had a, a, a Straußenwirtschaft, so they were selling wines just open. They they had some vineyards, but they were selling it just in their private uh, in the in the in the, in the restaurant, uh, not restaurant, but but you could have something to eat and, and drink the wines. I've never been there at that time, and then he decided um, to um, to install himself as a. So he left the Domain Wachau and become a full-time producer. Um, I don't know, he's not that big, of, of only a few hectares, but, but amazing <laughs> size. And he's located in the, in the Spitzer Graben, which is, again, not at the Danube, it's, it's in a side valley. So it's backstage, to be honest. You don't see the, uh, you don't see the river. Uh, but you see the hailstorms coming from the north and the rains, so it's it's a pretty dangerous region as well. So much cooler, and vegetation period is always later than, for example, in Dürnstein or in Leuben. 
um, it, it's, you could almost call it another region. So it's a very special part of Wachau and, and I think it was last year, as I suffered several times, they have spring frost problems and then they had the hail in, uh, I think it was in 20, 2020, um, with a great loss of, of, of grapes. And so um, it, it's dangerous. It's danger dangerous making wine there. Uh, Martin Mutenthaler has its only very um, stony, rocky terroirs. It's it's all on terraces, um, small terraces, and he has extremely low yields. Not because he has to the, the green harvest or so, but but the soils are so poor that they and the wines are pretty old that the. Uh, the yield is al it's always pretty pretty low, and um, he does some maceration time and he ferments his wine spontaneously, so with natural yeast in in s in uh, smaller oak barrels. Um, that is that is rather new, and you know that the producers of the Vinea Wachau, uh, they don't accept if if their wines have any smell of oak. Ma that doesn't mean they are not allowed to to use oak, but it has to be large, and you you are not a, you cannot smell it. If if you do, you cannot call it smaragd. And um, so, I think he, Martin was a very short time member of the Vinea, and then uh, he said, "No, I uh, and uh, I also don't want to use the smaragd term. Uh, I want to communicate my terroirs, my sites." And so he decided uh, to leave it. Just after one or two years, I don't remember. It's quite like Peter Meider, Weider Malberg, and the, you, you, they are pretty working pretty similar. Um, organic. I don't think that he's. I'm not sure if he's he's certified, uh, but he, he's working organic, and um, yeah, and he also sells the wines only two years after the harvest, and um, keep them for f uh, at least a full year on the full lease. I think it's a year he, he, he erects them um, just before the harvest because he needs uh, the rats again. And he's using uh, barrels from, from Franz Stockinger, Austrian coopery, with, uh, with just only, as far as I know, Austrian oak. This wine has an impressive length and structure, I find. Um, it's, it's, it's very dense, it's very long, it's still very young. It doesn't have the sweetness of, of the group from the Kamta, from Gobelsburg. It has also, for me, more, more richness, more power, more, more structure, more length, and also a great aging potential, I'm sure. It, it would be too, too, too young for me to drink it now, but, but this is a, uh, it's a, it's a great Grunefeld Liner from the 19th vintage. <coughs> Very salty and you can really taste the low yields he had in that year. And um, well, it's uh, impressive again. I didn't have it for a year now, but I like it. Um, so let's go ahead to another guy. He was so connected with Grünefeld Liner because for a long time he didn't have any other grape variety except of Grünefeld Liner. Bernhard Ott, the big guy from the from the Wagram in Feuersbrunn, those that's um, east of, of the Kamtal, uh, more going towards towards Wien, uh, Vienna. And uh, there most of the vineyards are completely on Lösch soils. And uh, they are not that steep, but uh, it's it's more flat. But sometimes it's terraced. And this Riedkirchtal, I think it's pretty new. I don't have a good record of this wine. Um, um, and uh, I I find it uh, also quite impressive, as as because in the last years Bernard Ott changed a lot of things. Uh, I think he, be he became uh, organic or even bi biodynamic a long, uh, relatively long time ago in 2006. I think there was a group of producers in Austria who, who, who like Fred Leumer and Wieninger, and the, there was quite a big group. Also, some guys from Burgenland. <coughs> they uh, they decided to change something in the vineyard, and uh, 
since since then it was it was there was several steps and since recently he also introduced large oak in, into his winery uh, because in the former times he, he was using only or more or less stainless steel and now if you come to the to the domain it looks completely different it's one of the most beautiful domains uh, I have I've ever seen now since he opened uh, so he's still in the old building, but but the interior is so beautiful, uh, made with a lot of oak. And now the cellar, if you come in it, there are large fooders and double fooders and triple fooders and all from stocking. Uh, and they're all new, but it looks absolutely amazing. And, um, and, and the wines have become much more, less sweet, less fruity, but much more structured. So he, he is one of the guys who really, uh, stepped stepped forward a lot, um, especially with the 19 vintage. And I think he has not yet reached the end of the potential. And to be honest, I had I would have never never thought that that, that the Wagram would be able to produce such salty, pure, and complex wines. And um, but they 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 can. And. Um, uh, there, I, I even last summer I met a producer with a fantastic Pinot Noir, uh, Strobel. I, I don't know if you ever heard about him. He's very small um, producer. He's uh, next door to um, in Oberstockstall. To uh, he he was a former advertiser. He's still an advertiser, but but he has a few few hectares and does amazing wines and maybe one of the finest Pinot Noirs I've ever had from, from Austria. Um, but back to, to, to Bernhard. You see what I mean? The, the, the wine is rich and ripe on the palette, although I have to say that Bernard is one of the early pickers in the in the region. He's one of the first. So I think Hirsch, um, Hannes Hirsch goes out even earlier. I remember I had a tasting there end of August and he said, now I'm going to harvest. I started my harvest yesterday and now it's the second day and it was roughly around 25 or 26 of August in, in 18 or so. So I was really surprised. Um, because you know when when I started covering Austria they were picking in the in November and now this guy started in August so this was this new times and uh, I think it's uh, he is still on the on the edge you know if you if you pick it too early you I mean you have the freshness but but you don't have the right phenolics so and and the wines could could get pretty pretty hard on the palate and um, I think acidity is always good but the, the grapes have to be ripe and they have to be aromatic or intense as well and um, but so he's he's sailing on the edge I would say with this um, early harvest but but the finish I, I like a lot this saltiness and you know that less is it's all, all it's often described as a soil that gives very rich and textured and smooth wines um i'm if, if you do it well or if you do a good vineyard management <coughs> i think i often i'm much more on the on the limestone terra or on the chalkiness and you know that that in fact less is it's very weathered chalk um, uh, alpine uh, limestone and um <coughs> So it's 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 an interesting soil and and can give such precise wines. So and again, um, also Ben and Dan Ott sells the wines two years after uh, the the harvest. So this is I wouldn't say it's a trend, but more and more do so in Germany, in Austria as well, and uh, I think we will see more more of this. Um, <coughs> Now we go back to the Wachau, to one of the most famous vineyards uh, there, the uh, Ried Leubenberg in Leuben. It's, I think it's one of, 
in general, I mean, it's uh, I don't know how many hectares it has in total, but it's quite big. Uh, Elizabeth, where do you, where are you, Elizabeth? Where, oh, you are hidden in the back. How many hectares is that, Leuenberg? Because she she knows a Leuenberg quite well. <laughs> a good, you don't know? Okay. No, that does map. Yeah, yeah, Google it. Oh, you have this Vinea Wachau map. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It, I mean, it's it's a very big site and thirty. Okay, thirty hectares. It's it's quite and it's not as homogeneous as you would think if you read it just one vineyard. Uh, you know, you have altitudes between where the, where the, the Leuenberg starts and, and more in the flat uh, and on the top is 200 meters higher and then you have some some um, some how do you say um, uh, rifts coming from the north that, where that bring the cold winds and uh, so the, the Leuenberg has many different spots and many producers have several spots and they make a composition of several spots um, and, and this can get that can become very interesting. Otherwise, I would say the Leuenberg, especially when completely facing south and uh, when completely on Loess, it can get maybe too warm in recent years. And so, some of the producers who don't have such many so, such great opportunities to have several spots, um, yeah, they they really have to deal with the winter. The others can a little bit more compose. And uh, that's 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 very helpful, um, I think. <coughs> I don't know how many parcels parcels Leo Altsinger has, but um, um, I never find his wines overloaded or so. The Leubenberg is that is why I selected it. It's um, he has obviously obviously the right spots. I know it's it's they had some plain facing south and then others they are quite high. And with the Riesling, uh, uh, the same. You you can see it's uh, different altitudes and um, uh, even different soil compositions. But but predominantly the uh, the Leubner Leubenberg from Leo Altsinger is is grown on Löss. And it's uh, it's vinified um, in stainless steel and in oak. It's always a mix. And this is for me a classic, classic beautiful Wachau Smaragd style. And uh, because it's always fresh, the, the, the grapes I picked late, but, but always healthy and ripe. And um, yeah, to, uh, this is a, a, I would say, a, a picture book wine for that style. I mean, now you, you also, yeah, on the finish, you feel the warmth of the vintage now. It's very, very ripe and juicy, almost tropical fruit. Now it's in the phases, I would say, that the wine becomes richer than I remember it. But um, but again, fine, good freshness, good good grip on, on the finish. Um, and it's a pity that the wines are, especially in Austria, I think the 19s are empty. The bottles are all empty since since uh, at least 21 or early 21, probably. They are, they are drunk so, so early, often. I hope there are some collectors uh, also collecting Altsinger <coughs> because uh, they, they can really age as well. So now I have to comment on the finger hat of, of the Kellerberg. <laughs> I just got a little drop from, uh, from the Domain Wachau, which is, you know, the biggest producer. Uh, in the Wachau, and uh, I don't know how m it's a cooperative. Uh, I don't know how many small producers are are with them. It used to be I don't know 400 or so. I think it's less today, um, but it's it's really also a, a top domain for me. It's maybe one of the best cooperatives, except of Alto Adige that I know. Uh, the w they have a wi wide variety variety of uh, wine styles as well. I mean, the, they are also producing natural wines, wine with amphora in concrete tanks, and they are very experimental and very open to new possibility to explore new possibilities. 
and uh, and then you have the classics, which is uh, the Smaragd and um, and Kellerberg. As you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, it's it's also it's. It's a, it's a great it's a great terror for Feldliner and for Riesling, and also it's not a very homogeneous vineyard. It's you have some parts facing south, and you have some parts more facing to the east, which goes into a into a creek, uh, where there comes a cold cold air streams at night. And uh, I think it's it's really great to have some some vineyard there because you you don't get the overripeness because Kellebecken is. If you just have south facing parcels, it can get pretty powerful, but always structured as well and um, and you have uh, also different different uh, soil types here it's uh, this is coming from Kvöler Gneis, so a Gneis, uh, a Gneis terroir, so very stony and um, and of course you you have from the more east facing parts you have a less less influence as well um, also very very rich wine now very dense concentrated the warmth is coming back now the richness the the fennels are now a little bit bit little bit brittle uh, at the at the moment, but um, also age worthy age worthy wine I'm sure. So um, it's interesting to see how the wine de develops over over just now two years or so. Would be interesting to compare them with 2018. In fact. Um, Weingut Praga, um, another, yeah, it, it's always a personal question, but it's, it's one of my favorites as well. I like the precision in these wines and the combination of power structure and complexity. And uh, maybe also because I have experience with, with very matured vintages as well, back to the to the older than 1990 or so, and I never had a bottle that was over over matured or which was too old or fading away so these wines can really age well and the Ritz Veritaler it's, it's a very small very small plot based on very old vines I think the first this was a is a plot which in fact do, doesn't belong to Praga it belongs to a monastery to Stift Melk and he he leased it, and uh, uh, the the vineyard was planted in in uh, 1907, if I if I may remember well, 197 and 08. So they are more than 100 years old, and they they still have uh, plants from that period. And um, and you know that Tony Bodenstein, the producer, and his son, he's a he's a very intellectual guy and uh, um, he always looks to if, if he has something to plant he looks for clonal diversity and he also gets some um, some um, selection massal so he has a he has another vineyard where he has a wide range of different Grunefeld Lina genetics um, but Sveritala, it's a very, very small vineyard, as I've said, so the quantities is always very low and it's hard to, to get the wine. And I'm not sure, but I, I think uh, in 19 or 20, I uh, was at the Falstaff magazine or so, they, they've called one wine, uh, the, this wine 100 points. And um, if I remember well, you have to look it up. Um, and uh, then, of course, it was immediately sold out, but it's always sold out. So I don't have any bottle in my private uh, cellar of this. I like uh, I like the 
it's rich as well, but the richness and the sweetness is now countered here with uh, polyphon uh, with uh, with tannin with tannin and um, phenolic structure. This is what I really the grip on the finish. So everything is kept more tightly, and it doesn't become too broad or flabby. It it really keeps the line. That's um, it's fastest now one of the most fascinating uh, of the of the series we have like the wines present today um, and with this richness and depth yeah, I, I would think you, you you can feel a good vineyard management and um, and also the potential of, of really old old vines and maybe also old genetics it's 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 just I think it's important um, to have that because you don't get the stereotype flavors or um, uh, textures it's that's it's something unique and I think in, in blind tastings you might pick out wines like that um, so really impressive impressive wine but uh, he still sells the wines uh, yeah very soon after relatively soon after the harvest and when when is the smaragd wines going to the market I think in May after the harvest sorry To be honest, I I don't know the figure, but it should be really dry. I think I I, I feel what you mean the uh, the sweetness, right? It feels like you have a little bit more yeah. I <laughs> to be honest, I I don't know. I don't know. I think it's it's it has to do with the with the, the because the the grapes often look like peas, so so small, and uh, I think you have a lot of extract here. And um, and then maybe the acidity is also a little bit high, uh, slower, uh, uh, lower, and um, that often gives you a sensation of sweetness, uh, which is in fact not there. Um, I would four point three. Have have you assisted? <laughs> no, but you know it. You know it. Ah, you Google it. Okay, so it's it's okay because I never with, with uh, Tony Bodenstein I've never discussed about sh not not I, I don't remember that I have discussed sugar with him. Um, yeah, uh, I remember tasting with him um, when he poured me uh, the wines in uh, the the series of wines in glasses like that. I think he used it. He used the Salto uh, Universal glass, and uh, it's it's funny that. I taste the wines in September, so the the 21 vintage I will taste in September this year, and uh, I don't come along with the universal glass, especially not at Praga. Normally, I have no problem. And I'm using it at home as well, but but with the Praga, it's always I need the Burgundy glass from Salto, the big one, and then you have them in completely other wines. It's it's incredible. So if if I can give you a recommendation, it would be. Uh, try structure them big wines like uh, like Praga or other producers as well from why not from a burgundy glass could get could become really exciting then really another world um where do we go now we come to the to the knoll so the vinothek füllung is a special selection of of uh, the Knoll family, uh, Emrich Knoll. Um, it's as far as I know, the the grapes are always coming from the Leubenberg as well. At least it's it's all from Leuben, and they are picked very very late and very very ripe, and they also accept botrytis. And uh, so this is the old style which we had so, so for such a long time i remember with um, when we were all looking for big and bold wines in the 90s early in the first decade of this century um, it became a little bit excessive maybe in the uh, in the Wachau or everywhere also in Kamtal with this November harvest and and Botrytis and and then you get wines with big volume with texture very rich very powerful but it was hard to to enjoy them at least for me I mean that that were really high scoring wines of course and the Vinothek Füllung is maybe still in this spirit but uh, 
but there's so much finesse in it. I have to taste if it's still there. But if if I score Y99, that should be that should mean something. <laughs> so uh, if you choose 99, you have a lot. You have a lot of thoughts because you you ask yourself why can't you choose? Why don't you score it 100? So 99 is a little bit, a little bit like. Uh, yeah, you're hitting somebody in the face. <laughs> um, or 99 plus is really even more uh, terrible. I mean, w I, I had the unendlich two hours ago or three hours ago from FX Pichler, the eight, uh, 2018 which was also enormously rich and powerful. This wine, I didn't say it in the seminar, but, but this wine had 15.5 alcohol. And uh, you could feel it a little bit, but there was so much finesse and tropical fruit flavors in it. It is an amazing wine. Uh, this was one that I scored 100 because I had a special emotional moment then um, um, when I had this wine. How is it possible to combine such a richness and tropical fruit aromas which normally i don't want to have a cocktail when i'm drinking wine but they were fascinating and not not too overdone and and then this wine was aged in 500 liter no so barrels and uh, so with all the power that it could breathe so it became fa become became finer and for me here's something very similar it's even more more elegant more finesse more salty maybe um, and I don't think there's much botrytis in here. When I see it, the color and also from the texture, I think there's some overripeness maybe, but but I, I don't get uh, botrytis uh, flavors. But it's always a special selection, and I d I'm not sure they make it every year. Um, and many years ago, I had a vertical tasting of this wine as well, and uh, it's it's amazing when the wine has 10, 15, or 20 years. Then it's it's it's. Uh, becoming fantastic and I like uh, the uh, the combination of richness and, and roundness and juicy fruit with these um, with these um, salty piquant uh, finish oh yeah it's complex yo um, I would age the the wine uh, rather than the uh, food. No, it's. I think um, I I would try fish, but with the more creamy sauces also. I think you need something fat in it, but you know that the acidity can can cut it and um, and that the wine. I, I don't. I mean, it's rich, but it's not too alcoholic for me. Yeah. Or something also with with fruit components in it. Um, very elegant and textured wine, very well balanced, so beautiful. Um, please, if you have any questions, as you do, put them right. Um, now we come to uh, another. Wachau Icon Wine from Franz Hirzberger. Uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, one of the producers I really, I really fear when I go there because you never know how it ends, um, especially when the mother is around. <laughs> the mother is special. <laughs> and, and when you say, hey, I'm now, I'm, I had enough. You are, you couldn't be you couldn't be tired from from 15 or 16 wines so I have now you have to taste the, the wines of my other son and you know and she knows that it was my forced visit and, and I already had 100 wines or 18 that day and you mean if you end up with the Hitzberger the wines are always very rich powerful high in alcohol and and if you you had them all, Twi maybe it's more than 16 it's it's 20 wines and this baroque style always no fear of botrytis they pick really still very late or today they have one early earlier picking and then the next part 
two or three weeks later and then they're blended. Uh, but the wines are still powerful. And uh, But you, you couldn't do this rich style any better, I think. Uh, that's, that's what I always think when I leave the domain is, so okay, that might not be my personal style because I, I like to drink more quickly. Uh, but these are wines you have to drink slowly. And um, it's also when you're in the tasting new room, you have, you know, look at the color of, of this wine. It's, 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 it's always that golden yellow. And they have a spittoon from Zalto, which is golden yellow, is exactly the color of the wine. And they have the same color uh, in the roof. And so you are, you are surrounded by gold when you, when you taste uh, the wines. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, So this is also, by the way, it's also the Spitzer Graben, um, almost Spitzer Graben, but it's it's in Spitz, of course, and um, so it's 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 definitely cooler, uh, but it's not. Uh, you you can still see the Danube River, so it's n it's not like the the Mutenthaler where you have no clue that there's any river. It's more a ski region, um, but but uh, but this is still. And it's a well-protected uh, vineyard. It's not a single vineyard um, wine, by the way, Honigvogel. It's um, it's a blend of two sides. So it's uh, you know in the power you have the Feldliner because the Feldliner needs deeper soils. I, if you have terraces, you have it tends to have that you have the the the, Feld, uh, the Rieslings more on the on the rockier, poorer soils, and where you have deeper soils, you have the Feldliner. So this is then more more on the on the uh, lower side and it's a combination of two vineyards and always picked picked very late and Stefan is there big is 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 can you generally grow Veltina a wide variety of soils or is there one way to say this is the Veltina soil? It's um, Elisabeth maybe can help me. So as far as I know, the the Feldliner doesn't like uh, soils which are too too flat, too sh too too uh, too stony. Uh, it always needs a good water s supply, uh, it, it, so you always have the the deeper deeper soils or that the roots can go through. And um, uh, you know, of course, when I think of of Mutenthal or so in the Spitzer Graben, you don't have really deep soils, but you need a certain humus layer, so you at least there has to be something. Otherwise, the wines can become pretty bitter. And uh, Elizabeth, ca can you help me? <laughs> do 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 you have any Feldliners that are on extremely stony soils? It's the Riesling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it needs more. It's the same, by the way, with Tramina, which is not very popular in the Wachau, but uh, Tramina is also a great variety that needs always uh, deeper soil. And in the, in the when I'm Alsace, you know, the Riesling is always in the slope. And uh, the Tramina is always like Grünefeld Lina in, in, in Austria. It's uh, on the bottom of the slopes. And you know, Mamburg is great for Pinot Noir, it's great for Riesling. Um, and uh, and it's one of the fantastic terroirs for Gewürztraminer uh, because it's all, it's all iron rich limestone. And, uh, and at the bottom, it's, it's really a perfect soil for Tramina. It's always interesting to be confronted with my own scores uh, when you have the wines one or two years later. I let you know, I need to get that on my palate. Mm. So definitely Mutenthal is one of my favorites today. Um, then the Tveritaler, Budenthaler, Tveritaler, <laughs> and um, and the uh, and definitely the Vinothek Füllung as well. So these were the three, 
and and Hirtzberger will come. So I'm sure it's it's a hedonistic wine. It's a it's a mouthful of fruit, and you can't resist after. Now it's it's it needs some time, but it it will it will fascinate us all. So there are four, in fact, which I which I find in, and also the the odd. I find I, I like the structure and the length in it. It lacks maybe uh, this textural component to be really complex, but. Uh, yeah, maybe he is now in the phases where he picks maybe, you know, everything happens in in uh, waves, and maybe he comes back to 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 get some grapes that I that are picked later and more fruit intense as well. And the Gobelsburg, I mean, it's it's now today it was a little bit sweet for me, so a little bit too too charming. Um, but we will see. So. 96 is well it's 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 a high score in fact <laughs> for for this wine yeah but uh, i like it maybe 94 would have been nice as well but um i this was a special day when i tasted the wines i said what happened to your wines i had never had them uh, so bright and so balanced and maybe it was uh, it was the day so yeah are there any questions or remarks or other opinions or are you missing other Feldliners? <laughs> do, do you, you can you recommend me one that I that I don't know so yeah it's for all for all it's you know it's a it's a bit uh, of course, uh, but we don't have the, we taste we, each of us taste so many wines uh, that we don't have the time to to come because we are four of us or five are placed in the U.S. and three or four three three in Europe only. So it's Luis. He's in Spain. Monica. She's from California, but she's based in Rome. It's me in Hamburg and um, uh, no, Joe is US. William Kelly, he is, he is in between. He's British and he moved to Bonn two years ago. And then so he take over the champagne from, my, from me because his ways are shorter and he, he does, he is a, we call him, a, he's a wunderkind. You know I me, mean? he's, I don't tell him, but he is 32. And uh, he's so young, but the, the knowledge and the, um, the experience and his cellar. He's going back bon uh, Burgundy Grand Cruise back to 1905, and you know, in, and I see his Instagram post, and he's always posting about these these old wines. So oh, shit. So, but he was president of the Oxford Wine Club when he was a student, and so he's a really nerd, and uh, <laughs> and, and he's making wine in Burgundy, in fact, and in Texas. So uh, his wife, I think she's from Texas. She in, he in, in summer, he's always in Burgundy. And in winter, he spends his time in the US. And uh, yeah, and uh, he does a lot of work. But we, we will have, we will, after a matter of taste, we have two days together here in Zurich. And um, we will also taste wines together. Just because, I, was somebody at the 100 point tasting this morning? Or 12? Okay, then that would have been interesting because we had only had we had eight uh, one hundred pointers and they were so different. Which and did you have? Hmm? I had only one from FX Pichler, the Unendlich, and we had a Ikem uh, two thousand nine. We had a Cine Quanon, We had a Masetto. Uh, Louis always brings fantastic wines uh, from. Uh, this was not from Spain. It was from uh, from Ch uh, from Argentina, uh, Malbec. Uh, no, uh, what was it? Cabernet Franc with a little bit of Malbec. Also fascinating one I've never heard of. But and then we had another one from Washington and and another from uh, Sangiovese from Tuscany. But uh, you know the the, the Massetto <laughs> and and also sine qua non. I mean, of course you can you give it 100 points, but I could never drink these wines. Personally, I, I, yeah. So I'm, I was, I'm always so happy that these are not my regions. So and I remember when William did Washington, uh, sine qua non is, uh, he had to to score it once, and Bob, Robert Parker scored it always 100 points. The uh, sine qua non, 
because they are big buddies and so it was always uh, had to subscribe the 100 points and and then William Kelly took over and uh, I'm not sure what he gave the wine but far from 100 more in the 80s I think <laughs> and this was a scandal and then he was so happy that they took <laughs> that took the region away from him again and gave him now he's doing champagne burgundy and bordeaux so he's uh, all the european <laughs> big region but this is where he was growing up with and uh, i think it's it's good but it is interesting we we all have different palettes and uh, but we are always discussing that, and uh, when you taste wine together, we will we we will discuss again. Uh, but then we go, we everybody goes home, and we all taste wine such since such a long time. You you don't really change your palate. You have it in mind that, but so must say to one hundred points, it would be hard for me to give it. I can follow her ideas or so, but it's not my. Pa I'm not used to this concentration and uh, richness and power. And yeah. Stefan, just coming back to the Feldina. Yeah. I'm, I'm from a region that has one Feldina that's well known outside of this, uh, Austria. Why, why, why is there not more Feldina grown outside of Austria? Is, is what, what's holding the, the, Austria, the Austrians don't give it away. <laughs> They're the unique selling point. No, um, in fact, I don't. I know that there are some now in in the Pfalz in Germany. Are you from the Pfalz? Okay. And uh, hmm? are you a Wegmüller now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but I, I, I. So we have in Germany. We have other. We have Silvana. We have Scheurebe, which are completely different. But I don't know. There was. No, you don't find it. That's true. I keep it. Not even uh, in the going the, the, uh, beyond the eastern border. You know, you have the wine fiddle, you are, you're the border to Slovakia and to Slovenia. It's very close. Uh, not Slovenia, Slovakia. It's in the Czech Republic. It's it's very close. But you, you don't find any, as far as I know. Riesling you find, but... Okay. Um, any questions left? We have... One second left, uh, one minute or so. <laughs> no, okay. Um, yeah, I, I hope you in enjoyed it. Uh, it's as I said, it's always interesting for me as well to be confronted after a while with less stress. Uh, in this context, you know, when I'm tasting the wines, I always in the context of the domain. But I prefer to taste the wines at home, uh, uh, at the at the winery, and then of course you come into the context of the domain style and. And now to have the wines like that, I, I would love I had the time to, to, to do that more often. But because that is something that really shows the differences. And I have to keep that in mind. So to me, uh, I would have had a, a wider range of, of scores today, I would say. But, but the 99 is well deserved. And uh, yeah, I could have given the Mutenthaler maybe a point more and uh, yeah. However, <laughs> it's it's I won't say it's a game, but it's you you do the oh we we all do the best we can do in this in this moment when you meet the wine, you know, and uh, I think it's always because I'm writing sometimes quite uh, long tasting notes and it's more interesting to read that I think than uh, than to see than to see the points. Okay, thanks for being here and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Oh, I see, I have uh, my own seminar. I have another one. Next room, Switzerland is waiting. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>